Yes, good day. Today is Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday, uh, the uh, 8th of December, yes. Tomorrow you have your test on the French uh, Revolution. Today, though, we push on with Napoleon and the triumph of, of uh, Romanticism. <clears throat> and if you notice, both in yesterday's uh, in yesterday's assignments, uh, I put a small comical um, video about the life of Napoleon. Today, we have one more serious. Uh, but I'm going to tell you straight off, uh, the college board likes to use Napoleon uh, as subject matter. Uh, since I've been being an AP reader, um, and that you're looking at five years, maybe six, I can't remember. Five. Um, two times out of those five years, the SAQ, or rather the DBQ or the LAQ, has been on the subject of Napoleon. Yeah. One year we had uh, an LAQ about Napoleon and a DBQ about uh, French attitudes about immigration. So it was an all France. Uh, writing, writing assignment. The point of the matter is, uh, Napoleon is very popular. Now, having said that, uh, you'll find that even though Napoleon is mostly remembered as a military guy, victories uh, and brilliant, you know, things like that. <clears throat> pardon me. Um, they do not, the uh, AP Euro guys, do not talk about his military victories. No, they talk about the changes he brought on, such as um, the Code de Napoleon. So, but now, that some of those things are listed in that document, those two short videos. The Code de Napoleon, uh, ending uh, feudalism, bringing, um, bringing forth the metric system and spreading it all across Europe. Uh, the... Uh, the fact that, for example, did you know it was Napoleon's idea to have odd-numbered houses on one side of the street and even-numbered houses on the other? Yeah. Uh, that Napoleon unfreed the slaves in Haiti. He un unfreed them. He made them go back to slavery again. That Napoleon... Um, set up a peace agreement with the Roman Catholic Church, whereby the Roman Catholic Church in France could continue to exist, along with the secular government. He, uh, for example, he established a school system for all males under the age of 18, uh, the Lycees uh, in France. He set up a system of promotion by merit as opposed to promotion by noble rank or whatever, uh, and those kind of things. But yeah, and then of course, there was that cute little thing called the Napoleonic Code, a law code that was fair to everybody. So let's get started, shall we? Napoleon, there it is. So Napoleon, born in Corsica, parent of Corsican heritage, rose to the ranks of the French military to become the bane of most of Europe. Uh, he was the bane of most of Europe because he conquered literally all of Europe, um, every country in Europe. In 1806, every country in mainland Europe was either conquered, owned by Napoleon, that's so stupid, owned by Napoleon, or were allied to Napoleon. And as I always like to say, this is a Horton saying, being allied to Napoleon was like keeping an alligator for a pet. I'm sure that you know the hazards of having an alligator for a pet. At some time or other, the thing's going to turn around and bite you. And so, yeah, and that was what Napoleon was like. For example, Napoleon allied himself with Spain and in the end ended up occupying Spain. And in the end, ended up losing somewhere in the nature of 160,000 soldiers in uh, a guerrilla war against him. But that's another subject. 
but yeah, he became, he was the band they called him, um, the Hitler of the 19th century. They called him, uh, oh, I mean, he had, uh, they called him Old Bony, or they called him uh, Little Napoleon, or, I'm sorry, or the Little Corsican. But, I mean, they were afraid of him because it was said that Napoleon's presence on the battlefield was worth an extra 70,000 men, uh, you know. And, uh, I mean, he was, uh, he was an ace in the hole. He was a military genius. Um, British parents would tell their children, you better eat your vegetables or the bony man will get you. And that's a reference to Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, trivia about Napoleon, uh, he carried with him a copy of the biography of Alexander the Great, read it every night for military strategy. He, uh, loved fried potatoes and onions. And when he uh, traveled on the road, he had those every day, uh, in his, uh, for dinner. And he, uh, was a very crafty he was very crafty about pr let me tell you what does that mean he knew how to get to his men for example you have to remember that napoleon's armies were sometimes several hundred thousand men and to stand by if you were to stand in one place and watch one of napoleon's armies pass by down a road you'd be standing there for three days i mean that's how large it was basically the population of his army was the population of a good-sized city. And so, yeah, I mean, and Napoleon, Napoleon's men loved him. I mean, absolutely loved him, which is incredible because he did some terrible things to them. He basically uh, abandoned his army in Egypt, of all places in Egypt, you know. He um, also traveled in very good comfort, when his men were trotting along through mud and cold and uh, on the Russian campaign, uh, you know, and he, uh, but his men just absolutely loved him. And he, he had ways of working his men. For example, he would, you know, when he's riding on the column, he would stop, stop a regiment of soldiers and he would go up to the commander and say, commander, which one of these men is your best soldier? And the commander would point at somebody. And Napoleon would then walk up to that man. And by the way, one of the ways that Napoleon showed affection was he would tweak their ear. And which was considered a great honor, of course, Napoleon. Although, although in actuality, Napoleon wasn't that short for his day. You got to remember that the average height of the average male in the beginning of the 19th century it was only like five, 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 six. Napoleon was five, two. But anyway, he would, you know, tweak their ears and, you know, he would go up to that soldier, the one who performed the best, the bravest soldier, and he would say, you have done honor to, you know, your emperor or your general, and you've done honor to France. And he would reach down onto his own chest which of course was decorated with medals, and pull up, peg a medal off his own chest and place it on that soldier's chest. And he says, you know, if the rest of you can act, if the rest of you can perform like this man here, you will do great things. I will be pinning a medal on your chest one day. Get up, get on his horse and ride away. And he rides away and a ways down the road, after he's out of sight of those soldiers he just visited with, he reaches down into a bag on his saddle, pulls up a medal, puts it back on, and goes on, does the same thing later on. Yeah, but, you know, it worked. You know, men loved him. Uh, there was another instance when uh, Napoleon... Uh, was engaged in some battle and he runs upon comes upon a group of French soldiers who are leaving a town that they've just been run out of their officer has been killed in the battle 
and they are running out of there. They're leaving the town. And Napoleon says, where are you going? Uh, where's your commanding officer? And the men said, oh, he died, sir. He was killed, and we left the town. And Napoleon jumps all over them about the fact, do you know what a dishonor it is to leave the body of your dead commander? I mean, how you, you people will never be men. You left his body there. And they said, oh, you're right, sir. We are dishonored. Vive la France. They go back in, take the town, and retrieve their officer's body. And after a while, Napoleon says, you know, I don't really care about that guy's body. But I wanted to take that town. And so there it is. I mean, he was doing stuff like that all the time. Very clever. Uh, a very clever manipulator. Very popular. Uh, so anyway. Um, how did Napoleon came, come to power? Well, and if you remember, in the last stages of the French Revolution, France was governed by an organization called the Directory. The Directory was uh, a two-house parliament had a five-man ruling council, and that council itself was called the Directory. And the Directory, by the way, had a reputation for corruption. You know, I mean, they hold an election. They don't like the result of the election. And they say, okay, we're going to have another election, uh, which, of course, then caused the rioting. But anyway, so Napoleon at the time was the general, and so they bring in Napoleon to... Uh, settle things down and you know uh, they called uh, they brought him in and in the old story is he dispersed the crowd with a whiff of grape shot um, so the, the directory then held a coup d'etat to overthrow the government they themselves had created and eventually Napoleon when he gets back from Egypt will do the same thing to them like once again Having Napoleon as an ally, having Napoleon as a friend, really is like having an alligator for a pet. So, there's a reason why you don't. Napoleon crushed the Austrian and Sardinian armies and concluded the Treaty of Campio Formio, even though the uh, government in Paris had really not given him permission to do so, but he was, after all, Napoleon. Soon, all of Italy and Switzerland were under French control. Uh, he tried to capture Egypt, and yeah, Napoleon went down to Egypt, basically, like the video said, to disrupt British supply lines through Egypt, and all he succeeded in doing was stranding his army there. Uh, because, you know, <clears throat> when he went there with his army, uh, of course, he was brought there by the French Navy, and... Lord Admiral Horatio Nelson shows up and destroys the French naval Navy right there where they are, meaning that Napoleon's army has no way out of Egypt. So things got start going, started going bad to worse in Egypt where he was occupying. I mean, for example, uh, the French soldiers under Napoleon occupying Egypt. It's one thing to conquer a place, quite another thing to occupy, you know, to stay there. And the French soldiers, um, oh, for example, the Sphinx. The Sphinx, you know, the Sphinx in Egypt has the body of a lion, the head of a man, head of a pharaoh. Well, the, the Napoleon soldiers were bored, and they started for practice, or, you know, for, for larks, they just started uh, shooting at the nose of the Sphinx. And if you ever look, at any modern pictures of the Sphinx, the thing has no nose. Uh, Napoleon, and this thing, you're talking about someone that's 3,000 years old, and these bozos right there, ah, oh, look at that, you know. Then, um, also, uh, Napoleon, uh, there became, there started a Islamic insurgency, a Muslim insurgency resisting Napoleon. And, you know, they were committing acts that were bushwhacking Napoleon's soldiers. And so Napoleon said, we gotta, we got to find these guys. And uh, so they heard rumors or was made to believe that the headquarters of this Islamic insurgency was inside of a mosque. And Napoleon's soldiers rode their horses into the mosque. 
and um, I don't, we don't have any Muslim students in here, but I will tell you straight up, the first thing that Muslims do before they go into a mosque, they take off their own shoes. And then they go and they cleanse themselves in a process called ablution so they can be worthy to be presented to God. And so these French soldiers rode horses into the mosque. I'm not sure how much you know about horses, but horses aren't exactly uh, housebroken. You know what I'm saying here? And so, yeah, and that offended the Muslim population of, of Cairo, which they're all Muslim at that time. Okay, 90% Muslim. Still, it made things very uncomfortable for um, Napoleon. And so Napoleon also has a team of scientists, or what he calls scientists down there, and they start robbing, uh, you know, robbing uh, bits and pieces of Egyptian artifacts. Sorry, uh, it is late in the day for me. Uh, bits and pieces of Egyptian artifacts. Um, and one of which, um, and I think I have, I have a picture of it. I don't know if I kept it here, but I do have a picture of it. Pictures. Yeah, Napoleon. Um, uh, yeah, Napoleon, what he does, there was a giant monolith, a giant obelisk, uh, you know, and you say, what's that? Well, if you've ever been to Washington, D.C. and seen the Washington Monument, that is a monolith. And they had one in France, I'm sorry, in Egypt. Yeah, they had one in Egypt, and Napoleon had his officers saw the thing down with a stone saw, a rock saw, and then they put it into a wooden tube tied it on the back of a ship, and along with Napoleon, I must have that home. I know, because I took a picture of it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to bring that back. Uh, they had that thing in a wooden tube, and they hauled it back. Nope, I don't have it. They hauled it back to uh, Paris. It still stands in Paris. They, I do have a picture of it, that I will have to send myself here. And yeah. And the point of the matter is, yeah, Napoleon's uh, little adventure in Egypt wasn't very successful. But Napoleon was the master of public relations. So he took this, took this wooden tube uh, and other Egyptian artifacts. And also he had a bunch of coins made that he gave away. And, or medallions, coins. And on one side were the pyramids of Egypt. And on the other side was the face of Napoleon. Napoleon did win one big victory there, the so-called Battle of the Pyramids. Um, but yeah. Uh, and so he takes that back. And of course, everybody goes, yay, Napoleon. Um, where's my son? Yay, Napoleon. Didn't my son go with you? But see, you know. And Napoleon, uh, he, was, he was terrible at provisioning his armies. You see, the British army, for example, would buy food from the surrounding farmers. And even the French farmers knew that when Napoleon's army came through, you better hide the chickens because they would steal them and not pay anything. Napoleon wouldn't even, for example, give his own soldiers uh, canteens for water. Uh, for a French soldier, for your water that you carry with you, you either uh, you use the canteen of a dead British soldier, or you would find some uh, some wine bottle, which there were lots of those, and you would then put water in it and tie it around your waist, and that would be your uh, your canteen. Of course, water bottles have or glass bottles have a nasty habit of getting broken, jagged glass, but that was Napoleon. Yeah, I mean, it was. I, it just still amazes me to this day how much is why his armies loved him the way they did. Because to be real honest, he didn't care about them. <clears throat> he didn't care about them. But they cared about him. So anyway, uh, as it says there, he tried to capture Egypt, strand his army there, but was welcomed back to Paris as a conquering hero, and he made himself 
the uh, consul of Rome in a coup d'etat. Coup d'etat. I like that word. Make sure you know what that word means. Coup d'etat. It is obviously a French term. And a coup d'etat means a sudden overthrow of the leadership of a government. Now, it is not a revolution. It is not a revolution. In a revolution, you have lots and lots and lots of people participating and lots and lots and lots of people dying. Uh, but in a coup d'etat, you have um, only the head of the government is removed. And sometimes the head of the government is shot in, in, the, uh, in what is called a bloody coup. Or sometimes they're just removed and said, you guys need to go somewhere else in what is called a bloodless coup. This was a bloodless coup for the most part. So anyway, uh, Abi Saez, I'm sorry, the Russians, Ottomans, and the Brits soon formed the Second Coalition against Napoleon. Abi Saez proposed a new uh, constitution for France. He thought that Napoleon could be just used and cast off. But once again, Napoleon is an alligator as a pet. Uh, Napoleon will be the first modern political figure to use the rhetoric of revolution and nationalism. You say, what does that mean? Uh, Napoleon gets on, comes in on the end of the French Revolution, yelling, Viva la France, and we're all French, and we're proud of being French, and he's able to unite the country. And in what is called a coup d'etat, there's that word again, too, O-U-P-D-E-T-A-T, in what is called a coup d'etat, he takes over the leadership of the government in what is called the consulate. The consulate was formed with Napoleon as first consul. The revolution was over. Ah, this is one of those things. Napoleon abolished heredity, rank, and privilege. He didn't believe in them, in heredity, rank, and privilege. That's when you talk about changes Napoleon made. That's one of the first. Yeah, you say, but wait a minute, didn't the, didn't the French Revolution do that? Yeah, but Napoleon made it concrete. There was the chance that the nobles could take over again after Napoleon came. No, because Napoleon was very sensitive to the idea of nobility by birth. Napoleon figured that he deserved to rule because he's Napoleon. Uh, he wasn't born into it. He worked for it. But he was very sensitive to that Napoleon, remember, Napoleon is Corsican. He's not French. He has faced prejudice all his life. The peasant for please. Napoleon then made peace with France's traditional enemy, Russia. Fact of the matter is, Napoleon and the Tsar of Russia, a guy named Alexander I. Yeah. Alexander I actually were good friends for the most part. Later on, when Napoleon, I'm telling you, Napoleon is, he's a heathen. <clears throat> Napoleon, the love of Napoleon's life uh, is Josephine. His wife, his long term wife, Josephine. And the marriage went on and on and on, and it became evident, and by the way, Josephine was. Uh, uh, divorced, uh, but it became evident that Josephine could not bear jo no, Napoleon any children, and Napoleon just said, you know, I really love you, but man, I gotta have a son, so I'm sorry. Um, I'm, make, I'm making a change here. And after that happened, Napoleon actually wanted to marry the little sister of Alexander the first, to which Alexander's mother said, and I quote, there's no way that my daughter will marry that little Corsican. Yeah, don't you think that racism was not alive and well, trust me. And so anyway, um, he included, Napoleon included former enemies in resolving his opposition, such as, and as such, he employed a general amnesty, a general amnesty against his formal former enemies, he said, enemies. However, he had the Bourbon Duke of Eigen executed 
for trumped up charges of accusation and participation in a bomb plot to assassinate, assassinate Napoleon, just as a way of saying, you know what? Yeah, you mess with me, this is going to happen to you. Uh, this execution put an end to all the royalist plots to bring the Bourbon dynasty back to the throne. Excuse me. Roman Rule 6. Napoleon also, and see, this is another important thing they did, reached an accord, that means a peace treaty, with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Napoleon, smart, knew that the church, the church could be a political entity. Remember, and Napoleon understood that the great majority of the French were Roman Catholic. And he knew that you just couldn't say, oh, you know, do what, do what the, the old French Revolution had done and said, you know, we're not going to believe in Catholicism anymore. But at the same time, Napoleon didn't want the Roman Catholic Church telling him what to do. And what he did is called, there it is, the Concordat. Andrew. Yes. Napoleon reached an accord. Uh, Napoleon considered that, yes. Uh, however, he was suspicious of it because of the power it wielded. This Concordat is quite simple. He reached a peace concordat, a peace treaty with the Catholic Church of Pope Pius VII, and basically said, look, okay, um, Catholic Church is the church in all France, okay? It's the official church, but you rule their souls, and I rule what's left of them. Yeah? And church said, okay. Uh, Napoleon had all refractory clergy, reinstated forgive me and all those who had supported the revolution to resign so the refractory clergy the ones who never took the oath to the French Revolution were reinstated as priests those who had supported the revolution had to resign the clergy though also had to swear an oath of loyalty to the state which they actually did because Napoleon was different in 1804, Napoleon published the Code de Napoleon. Uh, the Code de Napoleon was a law code which actually was so fair that not only is it still the basis of French law today, it in every former French colony from Morocco to Algiers to Tahiti to Vietnam, the Code de Napoleon is still the basis, the foundation of their law code. This code protected ownership of property, but it also provided men's status over women. It outlawed labor organizations. See, that's another thing that you, you know, when you're talking about what Napoleon did, he outlawed labor organizations. Napoleon did not want to have people running around in organized labor trying to make demands on him. That just wasn't going to happen. But the code did standardize the law all across France to say, what does that mean, the standardized law? It means the law all across France was the same for everybody. Yeah, everybody. And uh, it didn't matter of your rank. It didn't matter what part of France you were in, city, country, everybody. And so I think that we're going to stop sharing now, and we will pick up tomorrow. Actually, we won't pick up tomorrow. You have a test tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday on the French Revolution, and uh, yeah, that'll be your assignment for tomorrow, and I'll pick up on Thursday, and goodbye.